think we're on. Can everyone hear Linda as well as me? Awesome. Yes. All right. Can you hear us in the Netherlands, Germany, Asia, Washington? California? The island I live hear? on? Woodburn, Oregon, <laughs> Canada? We, we, we were just yeah. tripping out at like where everyone is from, Indiana. You know, we're always totally blown away by the really international and global uh, group that we get in Pitch Clinic. Seems like we're a real resource for people in, you know, living in foreign countries, in small towns, and uh, everywhere who are looking to earn more from their writing. Anyway, That's let's exciting. take this off because we have so much to do. I am Carol Tice, Woo! and welcome to our first session of Pitch Clinic, which is Let's Woo! Make Your Story Idea Not Suck, as you can see from our, hopefully, from our wonderful slide. I am here with my wonderful longtime co-teaching partner, Linda Formicelli. Hello. We are, we, we love doing this. This is one of our favorite trainings. It is a fun, fast moving session where our pitch cl clinic students hit us with their best story ideas. We have a few slides and a few quick tips and then we will get to your story ideas and we'll make the chat box much bigger. And, but for now, we uh, will leave the, the slides bigger so you can read them. To give you a sense of where we are at today and what's going on, here is sort of the outline of pitch clinic. And we are here at Let's Make Your Story Idea Not Suck. Coming up, the next module, which is Anatomy of a Killer Query Letter. And then it will be Writing a Kick Butt Letter of Introduction, or LOI, as you'll hear us say. Then we give students a couple weeks where it's just writing, writing, writing. You're writing and, and submitting the whole time. But when you get to those two weeks, there is no new trainings. And you'll just be writing, writing, writing. And then do our four-week pitch challenge. We have reviewed hundreds and hundreds of pitches in Carol's freelance writers and community with our own mentoring clients and then our other classes. And over time, we realized that most of them had the same basic mistakes. So to get you started with your idea generation, we want to tell you what are the five biggest, most common mistakes that we see with article ideas. And Carol has the first mistake. And there should be a slide for that. Yes. Carol, are you there? Oh, sorry. Really take really take <laughs> a listen to these because they're going to save you a lot of time when we start critiquing because this is going to cover a lot of what you're going to see in the story ideas, which we also received just a record number of story ideas submitted for this uh, call. And that's why we do it again for our pitch clinic students on Thursday because we know we can't ever do it all here. Anyway, tip number one is that your topic is too broad, like this enormous pumpkin. It is so general and broad spectrum that it is never going to fit into a, you know, 750 word, 1500 word type of article. It's just not going to happen. Um, and one tip Linda has is if you look on Amazon and if there's entire books dedicated to your idea, that's a sure sign that your idea is too broad. Uh, you're going to need to pull out sort of a smaller section. So you'll see we have a lot of pitches that are like, I want to write about thought leadership or I want to write about, you know, healthcare. <laughs> Why is that pumpkin so big? Because it's too big. Anyway, Linda has the next one. Yes, mistake number two is the opposite of that. It's that your idea is too small, so we do not have a big pumpkin anymore. Um, basically, your idea is one tip or one piece of information. For example, you want to do a health article where every malady is corrected by taking magnesium supplements. So your one big tip in this article is take magnesium, or you've narrowed down your audience so much that your idea wouldn't resonate with the magazine's readership. For example, you want to write about a business problem that happens only to Hispanic female entrepreneurs over the age of 50 who live in the Midwest. And I mean, I totally made that up, but you get the idea. Um, you want to work on ideas that are relevant to a high percentage of your target publication's readership. So if you want to write about a disease that affects 1% of the population, that's probably not going to fly, for example. Carol? Yeah, right on. Um, I just left you a couple of notes in private chat if you can take a look. Yeah, I do meet myself when you're not talking. Okay, good. You better. And so I have mistake number three, which is a big one that we see all the time. I have to say, looking through putting the script together for this, almost every story idea we got had this problem. And that's 
what we call no news hook. And that means there is no compelling reason you've presented why people need to read about this idea now at this particular time. Uh, lots of evergreen topic pitches, you know, how to choose the therapist for your kid or how to um, manage your kid's first day of school. We've all re read these stories a million times before, so you have to find something new to say about it. There's a new study, a new book has come out, uh, some celebrity had this happen to them and it's been all over the news and that makes this topic fresh again. Um, the problem if you don't have a news hook and yes sometimes stories will get assigned that don't have a huge news hook to them but it's a lot harder and that's why we really hammer on this point is it's a lot tougher to get a, a no news hook story assigned and often what will end up happening is you end up in the editor's maybe pile where they go, huh, you know, yeah, we could maybe do that sometime and it, it goes in sort of the maybe pile and it never comes out or it comes out and they say we're going to assign it and then it get, it's get, gets pushed to the next issue, it gets pushed to the next issue and the next issue and if they pay on publication you're just never getting paid, you know. Sue Ann says news and or new. Yeah, everyone should note that the word news contains the word new. That's that thing where the editor goes, oh, my readers totally need to hear about this right now because this happened now in this trend or this issue or this idea. So yeah, there's no new idea under the sun, as Linda said in chat, but there's got to be a new twist, a new development, a new spin a new idea, a new research study came out, a, a new celebrity arrest, <laughs> something happened, so now we want to revisit it. Okay, and I have mistake number four, and this is a big one, is that you didn't study the publication you want to write for. And we, believe me, we can tell, and editors can tell, when you do not know about the publication you're pitching, We've seen writers pitching shopping ideas to health publications, consumer ideas to trade publications. Um, they come up with an idea with only a vague idea of the markets they want. Like they say, I want to pitch women's magazines or I'm going to send this to business magazines. And they don't have an exact idea of what publication their idea might be a fit for. Um, for example, there are women's magazines for women with young kids, women with older kids, women over 50, women under 30, women of different ethnicities. So saying I want to write this for women's magazines is pretty vague and these days there's just no excuse for not being able to find the exact right markets to pitch just about every magazine has at least some of their archives online they have a mission statement you can often get the publications media kit online which outlines the readers demographics and upcoming topics they're going to tackle so a big note for this class is when we say study the publication and identify what magazine or website your idea is for, we don't want an answer like business magazines or women's magazines. We want to hear Inc. or Working Woman or Red Book, an actual publication name or preferably a handful of them that you have analyzed and you can see they're a real fit for your idea. That means the publication is running similar types of stories to yours but they haven't run something right on your exact topic in the past couple of years. And that does take just a little bit of research. Carol? Yeah, and that was super common in the pitches that we got, where uh, we got a ton of, this will be for women's magazines or something, or I, I, I plan to look up the magazine. You should know the publication before you're refining your story idea or you're wasting your time. So. You want to study publications. It's a big gap that we really uh, push our pitch clinic students and get them going on, and it makes a big, big difference. So I have tip number five. Your idea is all about you, your advice, or your friends. And we totally understand that new writers want to write about their own experiences because it's easy and it's not scary and you feel like you know all about it. And um, but the fact is almost all good paying nonfiction is reported and you and your ideas are not the story. You are just the reporter, you're getting information from experts and the real people affected by the issue. You are the writer of the story. 
and you are not in the story. Um, you know, unless it's Vanity Fair and it's all new journalism, you're writing, you know, I first met the Countess on, you know, but for 99% of uh, what you are doing, if you want to get paid well, you want to report the story, even if it's something that happened to you. Um, you know, I'll give you an example. At one point, I wrote a profile of an interim care, a, a preemie uh, interim care center here in the Seattle area. I was interested to profile what they do because my daughter spent her first three weeks of her life there. But that wasn't in the story. That was just what made me interested to do the story. Uh, I, I was not part, I was not the story. This center and its work that is mostly uh, unknown by everyone and uncelebrated of detoxing babies and helping babies that have had a rough start was the story. So, you know, if I can give a big tip on sort of how to dig your way out of this trap is just realize that, you know, if something happened to you and you're interested in the topic as real, that's fine. That's great. But you want to um, go out and report the story. And yeah, we can talk a lot about sourcing uh, in Pitch Clinic too, and finding sources, and and trust me, you can. And yeah, I mean, the real problem is that editors view using you using your own story or your friends as sources as a conflict of interest, because you have a you have a bias. You know these people. You like them. You want to say something nice about them, you know, um, or really just plain lazy reporting. Uh, that's that's it. So Charlene, we are hoping to have a replay later, so never fear. Linda? Yes, and I want to mention, can you hear me? Um, yeah. I want to mention that Ray said uh, she thought today was day one, didn't know about the first assignment. Can we still do the first pitch? And I want everyone to know that um, the first assignment for registered pitch clinic students is to come up with an article idea, but it doesn't have to be right now. We're going to be doing this call again on Thursday. You have a week to pitch your idea in the forum, so it does not have to be done on this call. Do not worry about it. Right, Carol? Right on. This is the kickoff. To yeah. Pitch. So, so if we get to your idea today and you have your idea, great, you know, you know, you can keep working on it. Um, but if you don't, we have all week, we have uh, people standing by in the forum starting tonight. So, um, so anyway, that gives you some of the broad strokes of where queries go wrong. And pretty soon we're going to be looking at our students' ideas. Them personal essay. Some of the articles I like are personal. Yes. Is a personal touch in an article okay? Why don't you just okay. circle that? Okay. Yeah, and we're actually going to be talking about this a lot when we critique ideas because we did get a lot of ideas for essays. And the thing about essays is, yes, you can always write an essay, but you do not typically pitch an essay. The editor wants to see the entire story arc, so they normally ask you to submit the entire thing. However, there is this one form called a reported essay, which brings in your first person anecdotes and your experiences, but then it also brings in experts to offer advice for um, how people who are dealing with the same thing you are can handle it. I've done a couple for women's health and one for fitness. They're much more saleable and you do pitch them like a regular reported article. So we'll be talking more about that as we go along. Carol? Yeah, I see a lot of people saying they want to write essays. The thing, the reason that we don't focus on essays in Pitch Clinic is they're not pitched. You just write them and send them in. So they're just sort of outside of the uh, purview of Pitch Clinic. I think it's time to get to the questions. Yeah, um, yeah although there is something I did want to add. Um, let's see. So you talked about all this stuff up here as I was we're in the chat. Hit, we're going to hit the rest of that um, when we... Uh, when we get done with some questions, unless we want to do it right okay. now. All right, no, but I did want to talk about, before we get to the ideas, just one more thing. I want to mention that especially for registered pitch clinic students, most article ideas writers come up with at first are called what I call seeds of ideas. They're not quite saleable yet. Maybe they have no news hook or they've been done a lot before or they're too broad or they're too narrow. But in most cases, those are fixable problems. So as we go through these, if we give a critique, that doesn't mean your idea is terrible and you should give up. 
Um, and a lot of writers in pitch clinic want to toss up an idea onto the forums and then have everybody say, oh, you're a genius. And then if, a, if an editor has a suggestion for making the idea better, the writer immediately thinks their idea stinks and then they throw up another idea and it just goes on and on. And this is a certain recipe for not getting out of that first assignment, which you want to do so you can start working on your pitch. So a very important tip for making it through that first assignment so you can start working on your query and assignment too, is when an editor has suggestions for make it for how to make your idea better, work with your idea some more. Unless an editor completely pans your idea and explicitly says this will not work in any way, shape, or form, then there is hope for your idea. And the idea is not that you just keep tossing up ideas until one hits, it's that you work with an idea and revise it with the instructors, post it in the forum until they agree that this is now saleable and then you can start working on your pitch. Carol? Yeah, right on. So, I think we're ready to take some questions, yes? So, I'm going to take the first idea here, which was from Stephanie. When your child needs professional counseling, 10 questions to ask the counselor before the first visit. Um, she says, if a child needs help, choosing the right therapist is essential. I recommend a telephone interview before the first visit. Here are 20, 10 questions to ask. Um, and then under markets, she said, I haven't explored this much yet, but I'm sure they're out there. So, you know, I, I highly recommend looking at the markets and then developing the idea. It'll save a lot of time wasting. Um, I'm wondering if people want to post in chat about what they see wrong here. What might be... Uh, what might be, uh, you know, uh, problematic here? Yeah, this is a, a topic we've seen before. What, to, what, how to choose a counselor for your child who needs a therapist? So the question is, what's new? What, why do I need to read this again now? Because I've seen this already. And the other big problem is, I recommend. That sounds like this person is planning to put themselves up as the expert. And here's what happens if you do that you're not going to get paid anything. Uh, if you are the expert and at the bottom of this, it's going to write, Stephanie is a therapist who practices in, you know, uh, Seattle. They're going to assume that you're writing that article to promote your therapy business and that you don't, do not need to be paid as a writer. So that's the issue there. And that's why you go report it, even if you know all about it. Um, you know, Linda and I know all about writing, and when we write for Writer's Digest or the Writer's Market, we go interview other writing coaches and quote them. So that's uh, just something everybody needs to know. You know, and I, I'm maybe there's some some famous child who's been seeing a therapist, and now they've gone on a rampage. And you know, I'd love to develop a fun news angle for that story, and there could well be one out there. So you know, just think about how to make it fresh. Yeah, and also, Stephanie, um, I think there are a lot of different ways you could go with this to make it more creative and something an editor hasn't seen before. For example, one of my favorite tips is to add the word surprising to your idea. It could just be for your working title, or you could put it right in the title. But in this case, it would be 10 surprising questions to ask your child's counselor would be your subhead. And then your task is to interview experts and get their most surprising little known tips. Um, that is a really good way of making something fresh because it's like, oh, we've seen this before. Oh, but you haven't seen these tips, you know. Um, you could also change up the angle by, for example, interviewing real life moms about the top questions they ask their child's counselor that help them get results. There are a lot of different ways you can package. It's called packaging, the way you format an article, a charticle, you know, a Q&A, a quiz that could make this different. Carol? Right on. I think you have the next one too. Or, or did you do this self I do one? have the next Sorry. one. No, I yeah. do. Lauren has the five biggest myths about self-employment and how I tackle them. It will allow readers to consider the reality of self-employment for taking before taking the plunge themselves, giving given through examples from my own experiences, results from permanent studies, and quotes from experts expert sources in each truth. I pitch this to self, would like to pitch it to Glamour. So this sounds like a really fun idea for a reported essay since you've obviously been through this. And again, a reported essay is an article that includes your first person experiences, but also interviews and quotes from experts that will help the reader put what you learned into action. 
And I actually am going to pop into chat a reported essay I did for women's health so you can see how it's structured and those you do pitch and a lot of magazines run them and they pay. So if you go that route, the reported essay, you need to change up your title because it won't be all about you, which is what the title makes it seem. And also, I'm not quite sure your markets are quite right unless, number one, they run work topics. Um, which I'm pretty sure Glamour does, but also they need to run reported essays on those topics in those departments that you're aiming for. I personally think you would do better with magazines aimed at entrepreneurs and freelancers, but if you can find a women's magazine that does reported essays on work topics, then that could work really well too. Carol? Um, so I have one uh, from Susan, when shedding pounds isn't all that it's cracked up to be, a personal essay about how, how hybridism changed the way I obsessed over my weight. So once again, personal essays, not pitched. Um, there might be a way to make that into a reported essay if you just sort of started with a little anecdote of yourself and then we moved into experts in on hyperthyroidism or something. So that'd be something to think about, Linda. Yeah, I was definitely going to say it could make a good reported essay for one of the women's health magazines. You know, you would, like Carol was saying, you take your personal exp experiences, but then you do research and interview experts for what editors call service. And service is how to advice that the reader can use to improve their lives. And a lot of these magazines people are wanting to pitch are service magazines. The women's magazines, the health magazines, the cooking magazines, the business magazines, they all have service to the reader. And that's very important in every article and pitch. Yeah. So Robin's headline is how I learned to love my body and the description is a personal narrative describing how participating in a boudoir photo session caused the participant to see her body as full. Um, you all already know the problem there, but so then she adds this could also be as a general top 10 reasons to schedule a boudoir photo session. Now this second angle, if you interviewed other people, I thought could be working. I mean, I think the whole boudoir photo thing has been written about. If it was, um, you know, 10 unusual or secret reasons or just between girls reasons or, you know what I mean? Um, it could, uh, it could work. Um, so, you know, something to think about how to angle it. Linda? Yeah, I really like that actually. I think that could be cool. And also we have a second idea from Robin and we're normally only taking one from each person, but this has something in it that I want to bring up that I think is really important. The headline is frozen hot chocolate recipe and it's a kid friendly recipe that is enjoyable to create, fun to eat and beautiful to look at for magazines like Family Fun and Parents. Um, so this is a really good start to an idea, but it's also an example of an idea being too narrow. If you wanted to pitch this as an article, um, it would really be a recipe and maybe a photo caption, which is fine if that's what you want to pitch. Some magazines do run pieces like this, but because this is not a reported sty style of article, it's not the kind you would pitch in the way that we're going to be teaching here in Pitch Clinic. So that's something you might want to um, pitch at another time on your own. But I do want to say that there are lots and lots of freelance recipe developers. I know some of them, and that's a whole different thing. And I suggest you look up Monica Biday, and I'm going to pop her name into the chat. Um, and it's monicabiday.com. She's a recipe developer, a cookbook author. She writes on food and recipes for various magazines. She's Her food essays have won prizes. She teaches classes for food writers. So if you want to get into recipe development, Definitely look her up. A lot of people do it. They really enjoy it. But if you want to sell a whole article on your idea, listen to the next one I'm going to critique for information on how you could turn this into a reported story because the idea of frozen hot chocolate really does sound kind of cool. So the next one is actually Caitlin's idea and it's the anatomy of a perfect butter tart. What goes into making the ultimate butter tart? Raisins versus nuts, exploration of the history, evolution, and making of butter tarts over the years. And she wants to pitch it to one of the Canadian lifestyle magazines like Chatelaine, Canadian Living, um, and Ricardo. And it would be a good tie-in to Canada Day. So I had to look this up. I never heard of a butter tart and I realized, yes, it is a, a Canadian dish. 
And Robin, I hope you're listening to this because this is one good way to take your love of food and turn it into a saleable article. There are food and regional magazines that run in-depth articles on different dishes that are of interest to their audience. For example, Cooks Illustrated does this in every single issue, although they don't take freelance. It'll be like, you know, how to make the perfect pizza crust and how to make a succulent roast, and it just goes into great detail. Um, but Caitlin, as for your idea, don't forget that you would need to interview experts on this Canadian dish to get all the details and advice and have them weigh in on the raisins versus nuts and so on. But I think that could be a very cool idea, and I totally want a butter tart. Carol? Yeah, yeah I totally want a butter tart. Um, so I have an interesting one from Heidi, Modern Day Outlaws, The Rise of Cattle Rustling in the West. She was thinking of Atlantic, American Cowboy, or Christian Science Monaster for this. Uh, and she has a source, uh, real life cowboy investigator Jerry Flowers, and it would be about how meth use and poverty in the Midwest has spurred a major increase in cattle rustling. And what's being done to curb that? I just thought that was pretty fresh. I love it. I mean, we all love hearing about, you know, how drug uh, epidemics are uh, devastating communities. You know, it's got that whole Schadenfreude thing going on <laughs> where we enjoy that. And um, that sounds like a really unusual twist so uh, on a way that's playing out I, I love it um, so I also have Vicki's portrait of a man as a guinea pig and she wanted to write about a man who was born in 1970 and he has type 1 so he's a juvenile diabetic and he just took you know various types of insulin over the years some of which were better and worse um, she was thinking of sending it to Latterly magazine which I looked up and um, they're into long form narrative nonfiction. But the question I come back to on this one is that uh, I don't know why this guy is the one diabetic whose story is so interesting that we want to follow it. I'm just not sure this is the right angle. Lots and lots of people have been diabetics since 1970. Um, we need to know what's special about this one story. Uh, and this is similar to the thing you get in business profile pitches, where people will be like, I want to write about this business, they're really neat. And I actually used to call that pitch, look at this business, aren't they neat? When I used to get hundreds of those as a, as a business reporter uh, from PR people. And there really needs to be something extraordinary about the person, truly uh, extraordinary. And uh, unfortunately, type having di juvenile diabetes, all too common in our society. So. I'd like to hear more. I mean, maybe there is something really fascinatingly unusual. But when I heard this man as a guinea pig headline, what I thought was I was going to learn was that, <clears throat> excuse me, that this guy, you know, did some early experimental medicine trials or something. But um, that doesn't seem like his story. So I'm a little, I'm confused. If, if that's a, uh, if that is a person who's in Pitch Clinic, I would love to get a few more details on it. Linda? Yeah, and, and again, you know, a lot of these ideas are workable. We just need to think and dig and do a little more research and figure out what is the angle here that's going to work. And as I was saying, often the first thing that we come up with or the first idea that we come up with is not the one we end up going with. And that happens to, you know, new writers and pro writers, so don't worry about it. So we have another idea. Uh, from somebody who does not have a name. Five families who left a foundation for the open road. Meet five families who gave up a traditional home and moved their families into RVs. Find out what drove them to make the decision as well as some of the challenges they've had to overcome and surprising blessings they've discovered. Potential targets are travel magazines, RV magazines, parenting and family magazines, homeschool magazines, and religious magazines. Um, and it looks like this writer is a full-time RVing family. So I actually really love this idea. Don't ask Carol what she thinks because we have total opposite views on this. If I could be homeschooling while traveling overseas, at least for one year, we would be like the happiest people ever. But anyway, um, I think it's a very cool idea, but you would need to focus, at least if you're working on one pitch, you need to focus on one type of magazine because you would write something very different for, for a religious magazine than you would for an RV magazine, than you would for a family magazine. So choose a focus and work on that first. And you can always work on the other angles later. I mean, the smart writer takes an idea and angles it for all different types of markets. But in terms of pitch clinic or working on one pitch at a time, then you wanna pick one focus. 
And then you want to make sure the magazines you want to target haven't done this before because the idea seems so perfect for homeschooling and RV magazines that I'd be surprised if they haven't done it before at least once. And if they have, you'll just need to come up with a better news hook or a more surprising angle that they haven't done. So it's still doable. Girl. So I have another headline which is uh, the rebirth of science, and the word science is in quotes, how to harness local knowledge for better climate planning. This is from Laura. She says, formal science is no longer the most important authority in evaluating and addressing climate change impacts. And she has a couple examples about people who spoke at a climate change symposium and a Sacramento area case study where a, trans, a transit agency included community expertise in their planning process and um, she would like to target something like Earth Island Magazine. Um, I have a couple concerns about this. The, the first is that I just a little deep in the weeds. It might be kind of more of a book topic, how to harness local knowledge for better climate planning. That almost sounds like you know, a book that urban planners have to read <laughs> with their jobs. Um, but I thought, you know, if you could find a particular example of that, could, that would make a good article of a community that where community wisdom, you know, helped them save uh, carbon emissions. Um, but the other problem I want to raise here is the quotes around the word science and the sort of condescension that uh, that I get in the tone to traditional science, that reveals you have an agenda, you have a bias here, that you think science sucks and people know, know better, re regular people, and as soon as the editor senses that bias, they're going to pass on this story. So you would need to sort of think about whether this is something you could do in an impartial way and um, about a way to slice this down so that it would be executable in article length. Linda. Okay, yes, and also I actually wanted to take something that Annalise said in the chat. She said, families in RVs article, what is the news hook there, please? Um, and a couple things. One is that sometimes an idea is so cool that an editor wants to run it even if there is no news hook, like, oh my God, we've never seen this before, it's really interesting. But so um, I think it would be very, very easy to find a news hook for this because I know um, because we did homeschooling for a little while, that a lot of families are doing this kind of thing, and I think it would be pretty easy for her to find a stat of how many families are taking to the road and homeschooling or whatever, so I, I'm not concerned about the news hook with that one. Um, but that's a great question, thank you. So we have um, a bunch of ideas from somebody called BI, and I'm going to take the one that I personally think is the most saleable, uh, although they were all pretty good. This was called Are Chores Worth It? This will be pitched to parenting magazines, maybe a roundup of how different families have their kids do or don't do chores, some expert interviews as to what's developmentally appropriate and how to deal with the kids pushing back against what you ask them to do. It might be interesting to have the parents profiled compare what they make their kids do to what they were made to do as kids. So, okay, so we have to focus because you have at least three ideas here. One is, is it worth it to give your kid chores? Two is, what's developmentally appropriate Three is how to deal when kids push back against chores. And actually, there's the four comparing what kids do now versus what you did when you were a kid. So if you were doing a book on chores, that would be cool. But for an article, you want a really tight focus. And I think out of all these, the idea of whether chores are worth it is a nice, what I call an opposite idea. Everybody automatically assumes that kids should be doing chores, but actually not everybody agrees. I remember one blogger, I think she's in Norway, who talked about how she never made her son do chores because once he's an adult, he has his whole life to clean and cook. It doesn't take that long to learn it that you need to spend your whole childhood doing it. So when he was young, she just wanted him to have fun and learn. So it could be really cool to see if you could find some of those outlier voices and talk to experts about the pros and cons and some reasons why you may not want to give your chore, kids chores and what the uh, upshot of that is. I like it. Well, I have a headline from Judy that I thought has some real nice potential, uh, but needs a little tweaking. No Country for Old Men was she thinking like a top head and then public defender age 70 considers retiring. So my first reaction to that is that he either needs to be refusing to retire at 70 and he's just going to keep going or he is announcing his retirement. I think 
um, it's very hard to write about articles that are compelling about people who are thinking about maybe doing something. It's kind of squishy and vague for us. But uh, I love the idea of 70-year-old public defender. You know, he must know so much about crime in his town and um, has obviously kept at it well past normal retirement age. He, he might make a good personal profile either way. Um, but yeah, good headlines are sort of decision and action oriented and good story ideas, not this might maybe happen or not happen. <laughs> it's problematic for us to get our heads around it. But it sounds like there's a good um, you know, personal profile of an interesting person there. She was thinking of it for Nashville scene. Uh, sounded like a great city magazine uh, choice, Linda. Okay, sorry, I was uh, in the chat talking about the news hook for the chores idea. And I have to say, you come up with an idea, and it's really cool, and then you're like, okay, now I need a news hook. And you can come up with a news hook, you know, you can then develop the news hook later. Um, so that's what I think was happening in this case. But I think that the fact that a popular blogger has come out saying she doesn't believe in chores could work, or um, if you could find a statistic saying a lot of people are buying into this no chores thing, or a book came out, or you have a really cool expert, I mean, anything. So. I, I wouldn't worry about it at, at this point, but I think you could definitely find a news hook. Um, there are some stories where we're going to say, where's the news hook? And it's like, we just don't see a news hook happening. And we want to know what it is before you go on with this idea. So um, we have, let's see, am I on Karen, Carol? Yeah. Yeah. Go. Okay, so um, Karen says, the forgotten sexual identity. I would like to write a feature about the 1% of the population who identify as asexual, lacking a sexual desire. I plan on describing asexuality as a forgotten identity rather than a disorder. It is specifically excluded in the DSM of definitions of sexual disorders. And would like to feature a few asexuals and describe how they relate to people on an intimate level. I would also like to examine whether or not they feel left out since they are not currently part of the LGTB community and find out how they would like the rest of the sexual world to relate to them um, and there, it, there's more here and I gotta say I love this idea but when I did some googling I found out that it was recently covered in Time and Wired lots of websites and blogs including websites for the LGTB community but to many people in the mainstream this is still kind of a mystery so I'd love to see if you could find a way to make the idea fresher and something an editor hasn't seen so, for example, maybe for a women's magazine, you could do a roundup where you interview five asexual women. Your lead in sidebar could offer some quick stats and info on the topic. And then the real story would be mini profiles of the women and how they make it work, especially if they're married. And this could be a really interesting opposite idea for the women's magazines that are always discussing how to please your man, how to have better sex, how to have more sex. You know, we did a survey on how much people are having sex every week. But it might be too out there for these traditional women's markets, so it could be a risk, but I really like the idea. So maybe think about it and do a little more digging and see if you can find a way to make it work for a market for which this is still news. Carol? Um, so I have one from Kevin. HIV funding gap leaves Vietnam at risk. I am passionate about HIV AIDS work and living in Vietnam. Has brought home the precariousness of the funding situation. Most international funding for medicine is drawing up in the next few years. That's a, a great thing where you can get ahead of a news trend and say this, this, this you know, pain is coming down the track and is going to run us over soon. Um, so that's a great angle. Um, there are a few HIV AIDS magazines, which he suggested. They don't pay super great, I don't think. Um, but he was going to interview doctors in the field and NGOs to explore the problem. Um, I'm, not, I'm just not sure. You know, the problem is that you have what, what I call an all-in headline. HIV funding gap leaves Vietnam at risk. Okay, I learned that now. There's a funding gap and Vietnam isn't going to have enough HIV medicine or uh, reach. It's really you know. kind of more of a newspaper story idea. Yeah, it's, a, it's almost like a newspaper story idea. I think you're going to need to think about how to make it something I need to read through and, yeah, how it could be sort of magazine feature-ish because it is something that's sort of coming down the pike in a year or two that, that's good for magazines, but you're going to have to find another angle Probably the human story, which I have to say was missing from quite a lot of these pitches in general, is instead of thinking of the general thing, like maybe there is a clinic you could profile that would exemplify, would emblemize the, the problem 
and we would talk to actual people with HIV and the people who work with them about what is happening and what's going to happen when this funding goes away. Um, and that would, you know, giving it a little bit narrow focus than a whole country. <laughs> um, country stories are, are a, a nightmare. <laughs> I've written them. And, um, they, you know, so many interviews if you're going to talk about the whole country of Vietnam and how this will pay off. So I would be thinking about maybe a city, a slice, a clinic, and uh, maybe something great there that's, you know, you're seeing a trend before uh, your average American knows about it. And maybe it's not for an HIV AIDS magazine, but for like a public health magazine or um, something like that. Cool. Yeah. So I have one from Doreen. The headline is how to research medical romances when you don't have a medical background. She said it's aimed at Romance Writers Report, the member magazine for Romance Writers of America. It could be brought in for other writing magazines uh, like Writer's Digest, which had a post on medical thrillers in 2014. And the idea is that when you're writing a medical romance, you need to get medical matters correct. If you get the details wrong, you wrench them right out of the story. But if you're not a health professional, how do you do the research? And if you actually do know all this stuff and you throw in all the medical jargon, then you're going to confuse the reader. So I thought that was a very cool idea. I like the way you mentioned in your idea you already have experts, um, ideas for experts lined up. My only concern is that there is only really one good market for this, which is the romance writers one you mentioned. But you also mentioned Writer's Digest, so I spoke with Zach who is one of our instructors in Pitch Clinic, who used to be an editor at Writer's Digest, and I'm going to read you what he said. He said, for Writer's Digest, there could be an article about the medical romance market, which a lot of writers probably don't know about. What it is, examples of books, agents, sales figures, how to pull it off accurately, or, and perhaps better, and definitely a much smaller FOB piece, for everybody who doesn't know that's a small front of the book piece, there's a section I created in Writer's Digest called Good to Know. If she wanted to broaden the topic, it could be about how to get medical details right in your fiction. The column features common misconceptions and how to correct them. For instance, I wrote installments on the difference between a psychologist and a psychiatrist, the difference between semi-automatic pistols and revolvers, etc. Depending on how much she knows, it could expand into a larger feature too about how to get medical details right in your fiction, all in all, probably best to pitch it as an inkwell piece. So Doreen, if you are here listening to this, I suggest that you post this idea in the forum and work on it with Zach, who is one of our instructors who used to work for Writer's Digest and pitches to Writer's Digest. What do you think, Carol? Yeah, absolutely. So I have a, a uh, headline from someone who did not leave their name, as many people did not. And if your name was in your email, then we don't know your name. Uh, this one is Making Whiskey the Hard Way, A Day in the Life of George Dickel's Al Alyssa Henley. Uh, these days, most liquor is made by combining personal knowledge with uh, computerization that, you know, controls the process. But at the George Dickel Distillery in Tullahoma, Tennessee, few aspects of production have changed in 100 years. And the distiller's job is about as traditional as it gets. Um, she did not identify the market for this, but she says most distilleries don't allow access to their master distillers, so I'm assuming that we know something about this uh, sector and that that would be an unusual interview. Um, I think people love stories about things being done an old school way, and this is really just a question of figuring out the market you would aim it at, and that would kind of determine the angle you would take it might be a local newspaper's business page or a city magazine in a nearby city. Maybe they're, I, I'm not sure where that city is. But um, she's also a woman distiller, so there might be a working woman or an Oprah, women who do make beautiful things, kind of front of the book thing. Uh, I, and I'll run on the assumption that you already know you have access to this woman and that you know you'd also need to interview experts for this kind of profile in this you know, whiskey distilling world who could talk about how rare and unique and unusual what she is doing really is that would give it sort of the credibility. It looks like I also have the next one, which is the oh, psychology. Can I, can I just mention, oh, mention something though? I'm sorry, Stephanie in the uh, chat says, I actually saw a link today to a publication specifically about liquor, and I want you all to be not surprised at what you will find out there. I, 
I actually recently wrote a post about if you were a sheep farmer, I found at least a dozen magazines for sheep farmers. My husband has written for one of them. I mean, the fact that there is a liquor magazine do, should not surprise you. Once you get out and start looking at markets that are online and on the newsstands, I actually read one yesterday called Pen World that was at Barnes & Noble that was for pen collectors. So just a little aside there. There are a million magazines in the Naked City and people do start Keep, keep launching new ones too. Don't think uh, that hasn't stopped. Uh, so I, I have one, the psychology of leadership, once again, no name, uh, the psychology of leadership's five concepts to make you more effective. Um, I think that's a book topic. And um, it says, I plan on discussing how motivations, emotions, charisma, self-esteem, and career goals can help leaders become more effective. And I would be pushing this in the business category. Yeah, we need to know where exactly. Do you think they haven't talked about the psychology of leadership? This is a topic that's been covered a lot, a lot of times. So the question is, what, what have you got that's new for us here? Is there a new philosophy of the psychology of leadership? Um, you know, we'd have to hear new things that we uh, haven't heard before that would make this surprising. Maybe choose one of those to expand on and find some way to give it a news hook and a surprise factor. Charisma, you know, that could be cool to focus on. How, how do you be charismatic as a leader without being sleazy? Um, anyway, Linda? Yeah, and charisma is something we don't really hear about a lot these days. So I think it would be really kind of cool to bring it back and be like, you know, you need charisma to be a leader. It wasn't just something from the, you know, from a certain, time period you need it now and here's how to get it um so anyway here's one that has no name and it's called from palapa to penthouse and palapa is a mexican thatch roof hut and it, the subhead is tequila's tequila's upward trajectory oh my god i can't talk today it says tequila has long been seen in western markets as a second rate spirit most suitable as a cheap passport to rapid intoxication or as the tragic enabler of jimmy buffett's career but this perception is shifting quickly as super premium brands surge in market share and small artisanal producers sprout like agave leaves in the jalisco sun i have no idea if i said that right i visit a handful of new distill distilleries in the guadalajara to sip the finest tequila and learn how these entrepreneurs carve a niche in an increasingly crowded field and talk to expert mix mixologists in Toronto about how they're putting this windfall of quality spirits to good use. Magazine, either en route, Air Canada's in-flight mag, or WestJet magazine, an in-flight magazine for a Western Canadian airline, both fly to Mexico and Toronto, so there's a double connection. So I have to say, first of all, kudos on finding magazines that travel to Mexico and to Canada good research, perfect fit. Your writing style is spectacular. That is something we'll be looking for in Pitch Clinic, which you'll learn about in a later lesson. You want your pitches and articles to sound not like business letters, which I think is a lot of people's um, first thing they wanna do is like, oh, it's a business letter, so I need to make it sound all formal and stiff. No, you want the pitch to sound just like an article you would find in your Target magazine. And a sense of fun and edginess is often appropriate depending on what you're writing about in the market. So good on that. And about the idea, it does sound great for an in-flight magazine, so that's a good choice again. I saw Esquire did a slideshow on tequila, an entrepreneur did a profile of a tequila producer, so you know at least it's starting to be seen as a fine drink, as you mentioned. You just need to make sure that this isn't something that's been overdone, because like you said, it is kind of hitting the big time, so you want to be on that trend before it gets too big or starts expiring. Carol? Yeah. Yeah, that was a super example of market match. I'd like to see lots more of that, of people figuring out, ah, this is exactly the magazine that would want this idea. I think you have the next one too, Linda. Oh, yeah. Um, I have one from Janice. It's a multi-person profile, a thousand word max, of volunteer trail maintainers in the Shenandoah National Park, selecting three to four volunteers responsible for trails spread throughout the park, two to three paragraphs on each person detailing an inspirational snippet from their past, why they got involved, and what motivates them to continue. Plus, I propose a sidebar of where to get involved aimed at readers, organization names, where, and contact information. Query targets um, will be regional outdoor hiking trail and general interest publications like AT Journeys, AMC Outdoor, Blue Ridge Outdoors, Virginia Living, and etc. Um, 
and this would be a great article for spring editions as people emerge from winter. So first of all, um, we need a headline for this. I'm not sure we were super clear on that. So when you do post in the forums, we're going to need a headline. And it's super important for idea generation that you be able to come up with a short, descriptive, intriguing headline for your idea. Because if you can't, it's a sign that your idea needs more refining if you can't, um, if you can't get it across really quickly. So about the idea itself, I think this could really work. It's a cool idea, especially if you found volunteers with really interesting stories. If you just rounded up a bunch of volunteers and they have lukewarm quotes and they're like, oh, I really like nature and volunteering is good for you, you know, it's really not going to work. So you would need to do some digging, maybe call up the park program and find, for example, a volunteer whose life was saved by volunteering there, someone who is inspired by a really interesting and important cause, someone who has a story about a surprising experience they had that most motivates them to continue like you want people with really really good stories and if you do that I think this could really work Carol so I have one from Bill that is the cost of insulin in 10 countries this would be a chart that reveals the cost of medication in countries around the world um, I think it's really tough to get these as a freelance assignment these are just the kind of things that our editors get a piece of research and they just throw a chart together themselves yeah, Linda calls it the seed of an idea. Um, I thought you might, you know, spin it into something like uh, eight ways to fight high insulin costs that, you know, talk about maybe creative, uh, creative ways to uh, spend less on it. Yeah, remember this call is the beginning of our, of our idea refining process, not the end. Linda is nagging me to say again. Cool. So, all right. So uh, we have another person with no name, but the title is how to transition from the treadmill to the road. It says we're in the midst of a second running boom, yet many new runners feel intimidated when it comes to taking their sh out on the road and off the treadmill. This how-to article would guide new runners on getting started on roads and trails, leading to a new level of enjoyment. I pitch to Runner's World, Women's Health and Fitness, Fitness, Men's Health and Self, among others. So this is a really interesting idea. It has a good news hook providing you have a statistic I can't even talk, a stat, or some other proof that there is a second running boom and that there are a lot of people who are afraid to leave the treadmill behind. My only qualm about this is that it might be a little too elementary for magazines that cater to runners like Runner's World. I would guess the readers are already all out on the road and that people who are running on treadmills are probably not reading Runner's World. I could be wrong about that route, though. Um, also, you have a mix of men's mags, women's mags, running magazines, and the way you write this query would be very different for each type, so you would need to pick one and then develop your angle based on that. Um, I love to... I love to like play with ideas. Another idea I came up with that could make this more relevant to a general women's health magazine would be to offer a roundup of how to take it to the next level in all kinds of exercise and sports. So for example, um, there are a lot of women who do yoga videos or CrossFit videos or other kind of videos and they're like, boy, I'd really like to go to a CrossFit box or a yoga studio, but I'm scared. You know, so how do you move beyond the I'm going to exercise at home all by myself to I'm exercising with a crowd in a public space? of all different types of exercise, that could be really interesting. And then running could just be one of them. Um, a, a one idea to make things broad enough for an article, a feature article, is to provide a roundup. So instead of just only running, it would be you know running and CrossFit and yoga and Pilates and whatever, and you would do a roundup. So that's just another idea, but I think this is really cool. Um, I have another idea. It's from Louisa, and it's the DDIY wedding. And DDIY is don't do it yourself. Many brides have been scouting out wedding inspiration since their engagement and likely before. These sources feature gorgeous handcrafted items, mason jars, bunting, spray painted wine bottles, photo booth props. While DIY weddings can be beautiful, they're also often labor intensive, stressful, and not nearly as budget conscious as a bride may initially assume. Many minor brides are also juggling full-time work and too many other commitments to realistically pull off a DIY wedding. I'd like to propose an article weighing the pros and cons of doing it yourself versus hiring professional help for various aspects of the wedding, including decorations, catings, catering, invitations, etc. I have to say, I really feel you there because last year I thought I would save money on my six-year-old son's birthday party by doing it at home, and I think I spent like $250 where it would have cost me $200 to do it at the community center. So anyway, I love this idea. It's a really great opposite idea because everybody's always like, oh yes, I'm going to make my own decorations. And you're like, no. Um, 
And the, I think the wedding magazines would really love it because their advertisers probably hate the movement of doing it all yourself. So I think you should definitely try that one out. Carol? Yeah. So uh, I have one. I, I think we're going to take a few more before we wrap this. Uh, Lorette said, are you my mother a cautionary tale? Um, people like to, you know, do adoption searches for their birth parents on Facebook and Everyone's rooting for the adoptee's success and a heartwarming reunion, and I don't. Uh, in fact, it takes restraint for me not to comment, caution, you're opening a Pandora's box. So this makes it kind of smell like an es a personal essay about her own unhappy adoption reunion. But um, she follows up with some statistics about adult ad adoptees uh, and their negative uh, reactions to when they do reunion so um, yeah I think if you take yourself out of this this could be a really uh, a, a good idea maybe for an adopted uh, there are I think a couple three adoption magazines we're both adoptive parents so um, yeah could be an interesting reported essay or you or or a straight story you know or a, a yeah, Your although I have to say, you would have to get not part of Pitch Clinic. <laughs> yeah, I think depending on how you do it, you would need to get rid of the bias because it's pretty clear that you are kind of down on it. Um, but you would need actual statistics, quotes from experts weighing in on both sides, real people sources um, that reflect the actual distribution of happy versus unhappy adoptees. If you can't get rid of the negative bias, you might have to turn this from a reported essay into a regular reported piece where you're not in it at all and your opinion's not in it. Or step down from the idea, which sometimes we have to do. But yeah, I mean, Carol and I are both adoptive parents and, you know, I, I can totally see something like this being in maybe Adoptive Families magazine or one of the other adoptive magazines. Carol? Oh, I have the next one, actually. Um, I have one from Desiree. The headline is K is for kindness, tips for teaching your child compassion, when to start, age appropriate strategies, online and print resources for parents, target publication is family circle. So this is a very evergreen idea that's been done in various permutations in all the women's and parenting magazines. But that doesn't mean it's a bad idea. It means it's a good idea because they keep running it over and over. But you'll notice that every time they run it, there's something different about it. Whether it's the way they package it, or the angle they take, or the types of people they interview, or a different news hook. So it means you have a good seed of a saleable idea, and you need to play with it until you develop an angle that hasn't been done before. And I actually have a good blog post on how to take a problematic idea and turn it into a saleable idea, which I am going to put in the chat right now. Bing, there you go. Um, but for example, you could um, select one tiny aspect of kindness and blow that up into a full article. You could find surprising tips that haven't been heard before, as I mentioned earlier in the call. And also keep in mind, uh, really research your markets because last I heard, Family Circle targets parents of tweens and teens. So they might be out of the age range that you're thinking and you might want to look at something like parents or Kiwi or something like that. Carol? Um, I wanted to welcome uh, Ava and Sarah to Pitch Clinic. I, I, I can't track all, all the ones that are coming in, but uh, but hey, welcome aboard, along with everyone who's already signed up. Um, so I have one, no name on it, a Lifetime Global Headline. I don't know what that means. Um, Does more transit help our roads? And the magazine she was thinking of it for was Equipment World. And it's all about how, you know, Major cities are under pressure to promote more transit projects to get commuters on mass transit. But how does the cost of that compare with the cost of road work? Do you drive up more space? What happens to road taxes? We have a lot, a lot of questions here. It could almost be a book topic. I think I've read a book on this topic about how the more we build roads, the more we pile on so we, we don't relieve the traffic jams. Um, kind of the opposite idea. And I've also read big pieces on how public transit initiatives failed uh, or had huge cost overruns that erased the kind of the value of doing them. So you're going to need to find a thinner slice of this to execute. Maybe, uh, you know, did X big transit project help X city? Uh, but I'm having trouble seeing Equipment World as the audience for this. I think this is like a city magazine or um, I, I think of an equipment operator trade as they just want to know how to 
be better equipment operators. I think this this might be sort of beyond this of what it is they're looking to know. I'm not sure. Linda? Awesome. And I was just talking in the chat about Family Circle. You know, I think we only have a few minutes, and I was wondering if I could go down to Tana's idea. Yeah. Um, I know it's like down at the bottom, Let me see, because I know she's on the call, and she, I think she had an idea that I wanted to talk about um, because of personal interest. Hold on, let me find it. Yeah, we actually have two from Tana, but the one I wanted to talk about right now was turn screen time into family time. Create a family game night with these TK games that capture everyone's interest, and it's an article about alternative board games, Euro games, that are often more interesting and challenging to older children than the traditional ones. I have a family I could interview for this and get their perspective. They play lots of Euro games, and I know many board gaming people who could suggest a number of games to get started. I could do a bit on each game explaining the theme and possibly connecting it to video games as an alternative. If your kid loves X video game, then try this board game. Potential market. Family Circle. So I have to say, my husband is the news editor of BoardGameGeek.com, which is all about Euro games. He travels the world and does all the conferences and everything. He's been interviewed in board game documentaries, and we're really deep into this culture. Um, and, uh -huh, Tana says her husband has, what is your husband's name, Tana? I'll bet Eric knows him. <laughs> Um, well, it's Eric Martin is the uh, news editor, and yeah, we're actually traveling all over Europe and Japan at some board game conventions this fall, so I'm pretty psyched. Anyway, off topic. Years ago, he tried pitching articles on Eurogame to various publications, including Family Circle, and they were not interested. The editor of USA Weekend, who I used to write for and was friends with, he said, and I quote, why would someone want to read about games no one has ever heard of? However, these games have finally been reaching the broader marketplace and you're finding them at Barnes & Noble and Target, so it may be time to try it again. However, your title does not indicate that you're going to be talking about a different kind of game, and I guarantee that the editor of Family Circle gets lots and lots of pitches on starting a family game night, so be sure if you pitch this to tweak the title to show that your idea is going to be different. Um, like you see a lot of them called Beyond Monopoly and things like that. So you really want to get that in there where I'm going to be talking about something that your readers have not seen before and it's really interesting and good for their kids. So, but yeah, I really like this idea and I wanted to get to it because of my personal connection. <laughs> okay, well, yeah, let me take a quick look through here. Let's see if there's something I'm dying to do. Because I think, you know, I think at this point, hopefully people are seeing lack of news hook, lack of we understand what the market is, uh, evergreen topic with no new twist to it. Uh, it's a big book topic. Um, uh, we had one that uh, I wanted you to get to this one from Kathy about tongue tied. Oh, yes. I wanted to do that one, too. That one. Um, I'm like texting Eric. Do you know this guy on BGG? Um <laughs> So, <laughs> I'm totally multitasking. Um, Kathy's idea is tongue-tied to snip or not to snip, discuss issues facing parents of newborns with a short frenulum, which is the piece that attaches the tongue to the bottom of the mouth. Short-term issues include difficulty or inability to nurse, which could lead to complications with incoming milk. Um, dis um, oh, I'm sorry, yeah, lead complications with incoming milk, decisions to supplement, long-term potential effects include speech and subsequent developmental delays, interview doctors and lactation staff, discuss pros, cons of immediate treatment and of delayed treatment, um, intended platform, pregnant and newborn. So I have to say again, a good evergreen idea, but I'm not sure it's fresh enough for a pregnancy magazine because since that's what they focus on, um, they probably would have covered all aspects of this problem. However, yesterday I had my six-year-old son at the dentist and he checked Traver for this problem. And I said, wouldn't we have known by now if this six-year-old were tongue-tied? And he said, you would be surprised by how many 15-year-olds come in here who are tongue-tied and no one knew that was the reason for their speech problems. So that could be a really interesting angle to take if it's truly a common problem in older kids. And I wanted to give one really important tip for making an evergreen idea fresh is to pitch it to markets that haven't heard of it before. So yes, the Pregnancy and Newborn magazine probably would have heard of this issue and been writing about it before, but ones for older kids, you know, they probably haven't seen it. We have an idea in here for AARP, if we have a chance to get to it, that I think you could actually spin it better for a younger women's magazine because AARP would have covered it a lot. So just wanted to um, talk about that. 
Um, I'm scanning. I, I don't know. I think we've done it here mostly. Um, you know, I'd actually really like you to take this one about illegal sugar substitutes that are sold in Canada. Sure. Let me see if I can find it. Let me do a search. Yes. This, this um, I don't have a name. Category of I call of sort of that's interesting, but what about it? Mm hmm. So, um, yeah, so it's illegal sugar substitutes sold in Canada. The FDA and Canadian counterpart reach identical conclusions about artificial sweetener aspartame. Both declared this substance is not fit for human consumption, even in small quantities. Um, it's illegal, but it's one of the most widely used illegal substances up here. Someone forgot to make it illegal to add to foods and pop sold for public consumption. All we proud Canadians do is import the hazardous stuff. We never break the law by making ourselves. We sell it to dieters and diabetics. Um, I want to sell it to Abilities Magazine, Canadian Cancer Society Newsletter, Diabetes Magazine. So this is, again, like Carol was saying, this is some super interesting news. But the question is, what about it? Um, what about this do you want to write? For the magazines you want to pitch, it sounds like you need to explain how this affects the magazine's readership and what they can do about it. But then, you know, if you research this, it could be as simple as, well, you read labels and you avoid products with aspartame. Uh, and if you find out that's the case, that's not enough to support an article. So I would do more digging into the topic and see if you can find an angle that hasn't been done that will work for some of your target markets. Carol? Yeah, I mean, are there some products that's in that the public is truly unaware that it is in it? Are they maybe calling it some other fancy name and like we don't get that that's what it is, you know? Oh, uh, you know what? I want to get to Christy's question about how you write for magazines when it takes, you know, four or six months for them, for the idea to come out. And that's how you spin news ahead to what will happen. And um, we had one uh, story idea that we went over that had a great example of that. Oh, the HIV and Vietnam funding, where he said over the next two years, the funding is sunsetting for prevention and treatment. So that's a great example of something that's a great magazine article pitch, where you can say, you know, six months from now, we'll be writing that in the following six months, this will happen. So you're ahead of the news. The other thing to do is to ask yourself what's going to happen next with any current piece of news and write about that, you know, talk to people, what's the next thing that will happen? You know, what hasn't yet been said about this? Is there a study gonna come out? Is, you know, an election will happen? I mean, I'll give you an example. I wrote about uh, drunk driving laws in Washington state and about the impact of drunk driving deaths on their families. And the way it was spun was that in the upcoming legislative session, a bill was going to be discussed to tighten the laws. So we were able to write it ahead of that and it would drop about the time that that session opened, where the, that that would be, you know, discussed. So if people were interested, they could get involved. So that's the kind of timing. I used to have a great big um, futures file when I was a beat reporter with all the days of the month in it that I'd physically drop little scraps of news into, but everyone does this electronically now. But um, you start creating a calendar of things that are going to happen in the future and, and looking at how you could write about them. How do you know what will be newsworthy in the future? By what's newsworthy now and what the next thing is that's going to happen as a result of that news that just happened now. You, st you have to start thinking about what will be the next domino to fall here. And a lot of times, you know, an election will come in, in November or... Um, you know that the Chinese ambassador will be visiting in six months, you know, that kind of thing. Start looking at, you start getting an eye for future news pegs. Um, someone is starting a study and it's going to be completed a year from now. That kind of thing. Yeah, thank you everybody for coming. That was a really fun call. That was a I fun call. I love critiquing ideas. Yeah, we love doing this call. It's always really fun. Uh, you know, it's always a fresh set of ideas. But yeah, hopefully this gives you an introduction to sort of how to start with your seed of your idea of what you're interested in and start refining it and looking at markets and seeing where you could bring something something fresh and interesting where an editor is like, dang, we need that. We need that article. And I was just trying to say, you can put up as many ideas as you want, hopefully one at a time. So if, you know, if for some reason one gets panned, then you can move on to the next one, although that doesn't usually happen. But eventually you're going to be picking the one 
one idea that you got permission on move forward and you're going to be doing your query on that idea one query so all righty Christy says I'm leaving empowered awesome yeah we hope so that is really the point of this uh, event and yeah we will see you right thank on. you everyone and, uh, thanks all we will see you bye next.